Can Europe be weaned off Russian gas? Leaders are worried that Moscow will turn off the taps if tensions with Ukraine worsen. But will the alternatives be enough to fuel Europe's energy needs? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Imran Khan. Russia is the biggest source of natural gas for Europe. It's crucial for heating up homes, especially during the winter. Moscow has disrupted gas flows in the past for political purposes, for example, when Russia annexed Crimea in 2014. So as tensions on Ukraine worsen, European leaders are worried about history being repeated. The United States is scrambling to help its European allies secure alternatives. It's negotiating with oil and gas suppliers in North Africa, the Middle East and Asia. The Emir of Qatar, the world's largest producer of liquefied natural gas, or LNG, is due to meet the US president on Monday. Washington concedes diverting global gas supplies will be a huge task. No question there are logistical challenges of especially moving uh, natural gas. Uh, we, we know that. Uh, that's part of uh, our discussion with a lot of these companies and countries. Um, but again, these conversations are ongoing and we don't intend to fail on them. Europe gets more than 40 percent of its natural gas from Russia. About a third of that passes through Ukraine. Moscow has already reduced the amount flowing into Europe, causing shortages and pushing prices to record levels. Now, Russia's threatening to cut supplies further if sanctions are imposed, and they're not just on gas, but also on oil and metals. Some countries depend on Russia more than others. Germany gets more than half of its gas supplies from Russia, and that dependency would increase if the German government gives its final approval to the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Let's bring in our guests in Moscow, Pavel Feilgenhauer, a defense and military analyst in Bern, Cornelia Mayer, CEO of Mayer Resource and a specialist in oil and gas, and in Berlin, Ulrich Bruckner, a professor of political science at Stanford University in Berlin. Welcome to the program. Let's begin in Bern with uh, Colina Mayer. Colina, this is not as easy as Russia switching off uh, the gas pipeline and America coming to rescue with lots of new natural gas, is it? It's a lot more complicated than that. Oh, it's much, much more complicated because, you know, these um, gas pipelines, the pipeline gas from Russia that dates 50, 60 years back, and these are old um, relationships and, and Europe only gets that much um, LNG gas, which can which comes partially from the U.S. Um, so it, it's not quite uh, it's not quite that easy. And for Russia, it's also different than it was last time around, which is 2014, when the Crimean Ukraine crisis happened, because at that time, Russia was totally dependent for its energy revenues on Europe. Now, about 30 plus percent of its oil goes to China, 40 plus percent to Oceania. And, um, and in, in terms of gas, also the Chinese um, uh, offtake is increasing. So whilst it's still 72 percent, um, it's, it's dwindling. So we are in a very, very different economic and geopolitical environment. Uh, Pavel Fogenhauer, that does that mean that Russia has, in some respects, some regards, the upper hand here? It can actually threaten to cut supplies, but not completely because it does need the money. But that does have an impact on Europe. Well, the Russian official position is that Russia will not threaten or cut supplies. Uh, but if there's going to be a further escalation, maybe even uh, some fighting on the border, that would more or less effectively actually technically cut the gas and supply at least through Ukraine. And so that's a situation where Russian gas supplies to Europe could be drastically cut and maybe could be cut altogether. And that would be bad for everyone. Because Russia, yes, it has right now been supplying some natural gas to uh, Ukraine, to, uh, to China. Uh, we're building up the capability to export some liquefied gas in the north. But still, the main Russian, sub, uh, the main Russian client is uh, Europe and, of course, Russia itself. 
Russia can supplies a lot of gas to its own people and its own industries. But Europe is, of course, very important. You can't really divert right now, technically, the gas that goes to Europe. You can't divert it to China. That's just simply or some other kind of market. That, that won't work. So this is going to be, if there's going to be a cut, I believe it, the, but all will try to make it very short because it's going to be disastrous for all sides. Uh, Ulrich Bruckner in um, Berlin. This is not just a case of kind of geopolitics being played out, but it's also geo-business as well. These pipelines aren't just run by countries, they're run by corporations. A lot of those corporations are going to lose billions of dollars if this goes on for any length of time. Do they have a say in what Russia might be able to do? Well, I wouldn't think too much of the influence of corporations, but it is very clear that it's not only about geopolitics, it's also about business. The United States became in December the largest produce, producer of liquefied gas, and their fracking industry all over the country urgently needs to explore new markets. So it was very hard for everyone in the United States to understand why an ally like Germany signs a deal with Russia to enhance the dependency when the United States provides security and Germany buys even more gas from Russia at times when we declare that because of climate change, we will reduce the energy hunger that stems from fossil fuels. Uh, it, that's a very interesting point. Um, Ms. Meyer, let's uh, take that up with you. There is a, like, we're, we're talking about not just business, but we're talking about politics as well. However, we have an interesting point there. The Americans provide security to Germany, yet Germany's buying gas from Russia. Is, why is that happening? Well, you know, uh, there is a very historic relationship between Russia and um, and Germany, and 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 the German, the Russo-German business goes well beyond gas. Um, but um, but but uh, you, uh, Germany needs gas to heat its houses. And when you look at what happened over the last few months in terms of the escalating gas prices and the inflation coming from it, it was was quite um, something, you know, 400% uh, more, 500% more. So that was quite qu quite a bit. So in that sense, um, if you are, uh, it, 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 this is important. And yes, we all want to do, we all want to be less dependent on fossil fuels, but that energy transition is not going to happen overnight. And let us not forget that gas is the cleanest fossil fuel. So it's a good transitional fuel. So in that sense, it's important that billions of dollars have been invested into the Nord Stream um, 2 pipeline. Uh, Pavel, this is not just about then um, the, the West worrying about its energy supplies. Russia relies on this foreign currency, the, the money it makes um, from uh, oil and gas pipelines. Like, so Russia, this is going to harm Russia as well. Oh, of course, it's <clears throat> any kind of... Uh, uh breakup of uh, relationship with Europe will harm Russia immensely. Uh, Europe is Russia's biggest, I mean, European Union is Russia's biggest trading partner, although in terms of nations, uh, China right now is uh, number one, but uh, as a bloc, Europe, uh, Europe is more important. And there's a lot of old, uh, really business relationship, especially between Moscow, uh, Russia and Germany. There's a lot of connections on different levels. I mean, pre Russian President uh, Vladimir Putin is very fluent in German. Uh, they even addressed the Bundestag once speaking in German. So the, the Russia was always looking to, for a special relationship with Germany. And Germany to try to, uh, very much wants to make Germany a kind of hub for Russian gas supplies to all of Western Europe, uh, possibly bypassing Ukraine. And that uh, would be a kind of breakup of that, uh, a violent breakup of those relationships would be very costly in terms of political and in terms of uh, money too. Ulrich, this isn't the first time we've seen energy being used as a diplomatic political weapon. This happened in the 70s when OPEC decided it wasn't going to supply uh, the West with oil over a variety of different things, including actually how much money they were getting for, for their oil. 
So have there been lessons learnt from previous uh, situations like this, or is it, uh, once again, it's going in blindly? Well, this is actually something that history seems to repeat itself, because the situation in the 1970s, when OPEC entered the scene as a cartel that drastically increased the, not only the energy costs, but the political costs, of energy for energy-hungry industrialized countries like Germany, we had a social democratic government. And the social democratic government used the trade relations with Russia as a trust-building instrument to widen the scope of dialogue with Soviet Union counterparts to pave the way for what then happened as the end of the Cold War and the reunification of Germany and the reunification of the divided continent. Now, again, we have a social democratic government and a lot of the older personnel is flirting with the idea that we could do something similar, try to understand Russians' vested interests and try to build a bridge and be less confrontational. This is also strongly supported by governors in the eastern part of Germany, who also believe that Russia has a point in its line of argumentation. But Germany is isolated in that perspective, and everyone else believes that it would be far better if the West speaks with one voice and sends a strict signal to Russia that it should never ever cross red lines and again violate international law. So in this mishmash, energy is not just a question of Will our homes be warm, but also will Germany pay a price by dropping Nord Stream 2? Uh, Cornelia Meyer, I see you kind of disagreeing there with what our guest in Berlin had to say. Why, why, why are you disagreeing? Well, I'm agreeing and I'm disagreeing. I think, you know, yes, Germany and the German government um, are, are very, and especially in the eastern part of, of, um, of Germany, they're very close to, um, you know, they, they, they do want to see that, that, that energy relationship with Russia going on. Where I disagree slightly is that the previous government uh, with, um, with Mrs. Merkel, it was very clear that, that Nord, Nord Stream 2 was non-negotiable and it would go ahead. You know, thinking of the billions of dollars that have been invested, you can understand why that is the case. Whereas now, yes, Olaf Scholz, he is a social democrat and he wants to see um, Nord Stream 2 come on stream, but he is in bed or in coalition with the Greens, who are very look very differently at A, fossil fuels, of which gas is one, and B, especially the foreign minister, Annalena Baerbock, is very skeptical of Russia and human rights policy and so on, and is very vocal about it. So, yes, whilst I think Olaf Scholz still wants to see um, Nord Stream 2 going ahead, it's not quite as clear-cut as, as I think it was before the new government. Uh, Pavel Folgenhauer, the Emir of Qatar, one of the biggest suppliers of LNG, liquid nitrogen, I can never say that actually, LNG, let's just call it gas, um, has been, um, will be meeting with Biden very shortly. Is that of concern to the Russians? Well, this is an opportunity, of course, for the American uh, gas industry to increase its uh, share of the European market. Actually, they have new export facilities coming online soon, and they can increase uh, their exports of uh, uh, gas and uh, natural gas and chalet gas. And the uh, European market is a reliable market. So yes, the, for them, that's an opportunity. And also, there's a political agenda there uh, to put uh, the Europeans into line and kind of lead them in a quest to against Russia. And that's kind of what it, how it worked during the Cold War coffin. And now apparently it's the old uh, uh, card table, the old cards, uh, but with a new meaning. I mean, once actually in, in during the 67 war in the Middle East, uh, America, was, which was then an oil exporter, helped uh, Europe out when uh, there was an Arab uh, a boycott of Europe and, and oil exports. That time it didn't work. Of course, in 73, it was already very different, and then it did work and very well, um, but for OPEC. But uh, America now is taking on that position, and uh, that's for them very advantageous. 
Uh, what do you think, Ulrich Bruckner? America is taking on uh, effectively energy diplomacy, energy policies uh, that are going to help it with Europe. I mean, is it that simple? I kind of think it isn't. Yeah. Well, I was really surprised a few years ago when the Congress sanctioned companies that are located in ally countries, in NATO countries, because this was unheard of that a country flexes muscles with such an obvious economic interest, although we de um, depend on each other and we are in the same boat when it comes to the security alliance. But coming back to the previous question, maybe I didn't make myself clear. What I wanted to say is this is the picture of interest in the new government. If you ask my personal opinion, the level of escalation makes Nord Stream 2 dead. It's not happening. The European pressure, the pressure from neighboring countries, the pressure from the United States makes it very, very unlikely that Germany can go on with conditions that have drastically changed. Well, let's put that to both of our guests. Let's begin with uh, Colleen Yemaya. Uh, Nord Stream 2 is dead. It's quite a strong statement. I don't think it's dead yet. I don't think it's dead yet because in the end we're dealing with democracies and if gas prices are going too high and people need, it's heat versus food, um, people will, 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 will go in and it's billions and billions of dollars and it's not Gazprom billions, it's also RWE billions that, that went in there. And just quickly coming back to LNG, liquefied natural gas. Yes, there is U.S. nat LNG that can come into Europe, but we don't have that many regasification terminals yet that can take out all the um, all the all the pipeline gas coming from the east. That's that's the first thing. And let us not forget, in terms of Qatar, most of the Qatari gas goes towards east, and China has become very big. China this year is becoming the largest importer of LNG um, after Japan and Korea. So we have real, real competition here for the for the LNG molecules. Uh, Pavel, the same question to you. The Nord Stream 2 pipeline from Russia into Germany, our guest in Berlin says is effectively dead. What do you think? Well, in Moscow, of course, that would be very bad news for other people. And maybe it's not that dead, actually. I mean, technically, it's built, it's there. Um, if the present uh, acute crisis over Ukraine and between Russia and the West, Russia and NATO get some kind of uh, more or less permanent resolution, maybe Nord Stream could be part of that resolution, say a kind of bonus for Russia taking a, acting uh, more uh, in a more kind of consensual matters on other places. It could be part of a, a quid pro quo between uh, Russia and the West, or at least maybe Germany would want to make it part of a quid pro quo. Uh, so that's not most likely yet dead, but there's some serious problems. That's a fact. Uh, Ulrich Bruckner, you've heard what our two guests have had to say. Anything there that might have changed your mind? Well, if this is a bargain chip, one can discuss it because it is very difficult to see what other outcome could be presented as a positive result that Moscow can present as a victory in this confrontational situation. If this discussion would have been a year ago, I would have totally agreed that we talk about energy and we are dependent on imports, given that Germany is fading out from nuclear and coal at the same time. And we cannot increase renewables as quickly as necessary to feed the energy hunger in an industrial country like Germany. But now that we face 100,000 Russian troops encircling Ukraine, Germany is not willing to deliver arms to Ukraine. And everyone else is looking at the largest country in Europe that is, doesn't live up to the expectations of NATO and what Ukraine expects from Germany. And if we then continue as business as usual with opening Nord Stream 2, then we become completely unreliable. But if this is the bargain chip and actually what the Kremlin is mostly interested in, that they don't want to dump the 
billions that have been invested in Nord Stream 2, it might be a happy ending for everyone involved. Well, let's talk about the other bargaining chip, which is Qatar. Colleen Yemaya, as I understand it, Qatar has a number of deals with Eastern countries, particularly China, as you mentioned. A lot of those deals are on 25-year terms. Great. So how, do, how does that change when it comes to spare capacity? Does Qatar have the ability to actually give some gas to Europe? Or is it all tied up in long-term deals? Is there, is there capacity for Qatar to get involved at the bequest of the, the Americans? There is capacity for Qatar to get in, to get involved at the bequest of of, um, of 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 America, but there, there are limitations to that. And then let's not forget, there's Australia, there are other producers of LNG who can who can chip in as well. But again, it, it becomes a matter of price. And yes, we have the geopolitical dimension, but we also have democracies. We have governments who need to get reelected. And if, if costs for heating people's houses in winter spiral out of control, that becomes quite tough. So I'm optimistic that, that one can find some sort of accommodation and that Russia is very clear that this is part of, 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 their, of their bargaining strategy to find some accommodation on Nord Stream 2. And let us not forget, you know, we all feel sorry for the Ukraine, but, you know, there are, it's, it's not been that clear, clear sailing between the Ukraine and Russia and between the Ukraine and Europe. Um, uh, it's 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 it gas uh, paying um, uh, energy bills and so on has been and has been a has been an issue. So so it's 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 just very very complex indeed. Uh, Pavel Fulgenhauer, like where does Russia back down here? Is it when they get reassurances that Ukraine won't join NATO, which is a key demand? Is it when they withdraw their troops according to the behest of the Americans, or is it simply when there's a, a gas and oil diplomacy political solution presented to them. What's what's the way out for Russia here? Well, it's a very complex situation and they're complex actually opinions in Moscow. It can't, it's not that we're all kind of marching here in one uh, uh, file. Uh, there are different opinions inside the Kremlin and the Kremlin administration of how to deal with the situation. Uh, President Putin, of course, is the ultimate decision maker, but he's more of a moderator between different serious groups of opinions. I hope that there will be, of course, there will be lots of military maneuvers. They're happening right now, heightened state of military readiness and all that stuff, which could result in a military escalation. Or it won't and the uh, maneuvers will end, uh, the situation will kind of calm down, at least in March, April, there would be time to begin to do something on the uh, front of negotiations. Uh, so but it's very complex. It's not that there's one kind of issue that changes all the rest. Uh, it's a very complex uh, uh, situation. And sorry, I, we, I are, we are running times, out of time, and I do want to come to. Sorry, we are running out of time, and I do want to come to our guest in uh, Berlin. I mean, clearly Germany is a big part of all of this. Where are they hoping this situation lands? Are they hoping for that it will be over quickly, or can they are they in this for the long haul? Well, it's not so much a question of timing. The demand from Russia to guarantee that NATO and the European Union won't expand any further questions the core principle of what Western organizations stand for. This is the self-determination of nations that can decide whether they join an organization or not. So we cannot decide over other countries whether they send an application to join an organization or not. Politically or practically, Ukraine is far from joining ever the European Union or NATO. This goes without saying, and everybody knows it there. So I do not really see what Russia gets out of this. And if it starts with a major statement that it is afraid of NATO is attacking the Russian soil, and in the end, everything, all it gets out is the opening of Nord Stream 2, it sounds a bit absurd to me. I want to thank all our guests, uh, Pavel Felgenhauer, 
Colleen Mayer and Ulrich Bruckner, and thank you too for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Imran Khan, and the whole team here, bye for now.